Uh, good morning. This is House Ways and Means. It's May 13th. We have a full and ever evolving agenda today, um, which is the way it is towards the end of the session. Um, we are going to start with S25. And we have Michelle Childs, we have Representative Gannon, we have Becky Wasserman uh, with us. And I think Graham Campbell is gonna join us when he can. Um, he's gonna be just a little bit late. Um, and uh, my hope is to uh, get to a place on the bill that we're ready to move it on to the Appropriations Committee where it has to stop before it goes to the House floor and then back to the Senate. So um, hopefully we can I'll finish our work on it uh, this morning or at least by the end of the day today. Um, so let me see if anyone on the committee has questions about uh, anything, anything they wanna uh, put out there. Uh, just to remind everybody, we have a joint meeting with the Commerce Committee on UI at 10. Um, and at 11, uh, if things go according to plan, we'll be back by ourselves and we're going to look at S79, which is the rental registry bill, which is another bill that we really need to uh, finish our work on, although we've barely had a chance to start it. Um, so uh, I don't see any hands up. So um, Michelle, why don't I go to you? Um, what I've done uh, just to... Uh, introduce it. I um, focused entirely on the fees, which is the part of the bill that is in our jurisdiction, clearly in our jurisdiction. Um, as I said yesterday, the uh, idea of having the Joint Fiscal Committee set the fees or have a role in setting the fees raises issue, various uh, issues um, that I think we want to avoid if we can. Um, and so I've come up with a substitute uh, for that process and um, Michelle's done the drafting. I think I got the draft at what time last night? 10 o'clock? I don't know, something like that. Okay. <laughs> um, so she's been working um, to try to figure out uh, how to, with me to try to figure out how to, um, how to make, uh, make this work. So uh, Michelle. Sure. So, um, so you should uh, it's a draft. I did it just as an individual amendment because I wasn't sure if there are going to be other, and then I can roll them into a committee amendment. Um, so it's dated uh, May 12th, uh, 859 uh, last night. So that's the version we're working off of. And the amendment is pretty straightforward. It's substituting um, uh, a new section 4A. 4A in the version that was voted out of House Government Operations, you'll recall, was the proposal to have the board be reporting to the Joint Fiscal Committee on September 1st and the process there. And so this amendment would strike that section and substitute this new section for A. And, uh, and this would have uh, the board reporting to the House Committee on Ways and Means, Senate Committee on Finance, and House and Senate Gov Ops on or before October 1st this fall. On all of those fees, um, it's not changing which fees they're reporting on. Um, it's the same ones that were contained in Act 164 for the, for the board to be, that we're supposed to uh, report to you on April 1st of this year. Um, and so it includes all the, all the state fees for all the various, the six licenses, the application license, the, the initial uh, license fee and the renewal fees um, for all of those, as well as the different tiers, because you recall that for cultivators and retailers, there's to be tiers within each one of those categories and maybe tiers for additional ones. And so um, this is just having the board report to, to you on October 1st. Um, and that's it. So um, all the reporting that they were to do on fees, again, instead of joint fiscal committee on the 1st, it would be to these four committees on October 1st. Um, and then, you know, what if the legislature is in, uh, has a fall session, you can act on it then, or maybe the Ways and Means and Finance can have a meeting in the fall and maybe tentatively agree and have me work on uh, legislation that you can start with at the beginning of the year. And at least maybe that will give, even if they're not in place, 
until January um, give applicants some idea of the general, generally what the fees will be, so some predictability for them. Um, but it doesn't set any specific fees because in talking with uh, the chair of the board, um, his feeling was that it needs to be kind of done holistically because the, the larger licensees are gonna be subsidizing the smaller licensees and you got to work back from the budget and look at all the number of licenses there to make it all work together. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me see if there's any um, any questions or uh, concerns. Uh, Representative Kornheiser. Not a concern, a question. I would love to um, just do like a quick walkthrough of the timeline. Um, would you mind doing that, Michelle, of sort of what is um, like what's imagined for um, sort of fees with this and then when the first licenses are imagined to be given and sort of from there? Um, I feel like we didn't. Does that make sense as a question? Sure. Um, I have a timeline that was that's based on Act 164. I haven't. I think I haven't done any kind of new one, um, but I would say generally what's going to happen is that the, the first applications that are going to be accepted are going to be for integrated licensees, um, uh, testing laboratories, and small cultivators, and, um, and that is, uh, I believe, March first that they can start accepting applications with uh, issuing applications starting April 1st. And I will double check that to make sure I'm not off a month. But um, then, um, and then it goes uh, and it kind of rolls out through the, through over the next several months for that um, with regard to uh, it'll, each month will be a couple new licensee categories opening up for people to apply and start issuings. And then the last ones will be in October of next year for retailers. So it's, it's gonna start in the spring and go through the fall with the rollout. Um, Thank you. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions that committee members have? Um, is someone willing to move this as an amendment to the bill? Um, since I'll move. Uh, okay, I, I'm not sure who that was. Was that Scott? Scott. Okay, David, you get to decide who it was. <laughs> um, and is there a second? Sure. Uh, right. that, that sounded like Jim. Let okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so is there any discussion before we vote on it? Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm, oh no, it's Bill on the phone, sorry. Bill and, Bill and I are both are doing way too much multitasking and I sometimes feel like my head's gonna explode. So, um, uh, so it's been moved and seconded that we amend S25 with this language. Um, as we always do, this will be a vote on the amendment. At some point, we will vote on the bill. Um, but this is just on the amendment. Um, if people are ready, David, would you call the roll? Yeah. Uh, Representative Beck? Yes. Representative Brennan? Representative Canfield? Yes. Durfee votes yes. Representative Elder. This is Rep Elder. I vote yes. Representative Odie. Yes. Representative Maslin. Yep. Representative Meadows. Yes. Representative Till. Yes. Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Representative Ansel. Yes. 10, 10 zero 01. Okay, thank you. Uh, and it's not in the bill, but um, I will be asking the speaker for permission for us to meet um, in October so that we can go over the recommendation. Um, and uh, assuming that it comes in, it's complete, uh, um, there's my expectation is that as a committee, we would take a look at it before we 
um, before we get together in January. I haven't made that request yet. So I just want to be clear that all I'm committing is that I will ask, um, but I'm assuming um, that if everything is ready to move, um, that we should be able to meet on it. Um, so are there issues on S25 or are we ready to vote the bill? Uh, Representative Kornheiser. I have another amendment. Okay. And does everyone have it? I think so. Okay. Um, uh, did you okay. want me to walk through it or did you want to explain it? You want me to? Okay. That would be delightful. Thank you. I also see sure. Representative Durfee's hand up. I yeah. Know. Right. Representative Durfee, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question, and I don't know whether it belongs now. Uh, wasn't sure if we were about to move right into a vote or not, but I had to. I had to leave yesterday before I had a chance to ask. Um, and Michelle, I guess I would ask you, and Representative Gannon might be able to to uh, help as well. I, I'm wondering whether a website for a retail establishment that's uh, purely informational or could be considered purely informational and not uh, subject to the advertising uh, restrictions that are in the bill. So a, a website that, that showed hours of operation, location, um, et cetera, would that be, would that be allowable or, or is a website just by definition under the language that we have uh, considered advertising and, and that would mean then the restrictions would apply. Um, you'd have to go to uh, the definition of advertisement there and then the board is gonna be developing rules um, that I think is gonna add some detail. To that. Um, uh, and so if you look at section five of the house government operations, amendment, there's the definition of advertisement in, in section 861 subdivision two. Um, and, uh, and then there is a, um, you can look at, let's see, sorry. So, so I'll just say, I did look at that and I still had the question <laughs> after looking right. at that. So. Right. Um, so I think that uh, you know, the, the extent to which what is on the website, I mean, I think obviously uh, businesses are going to have to be able to have some kind of information there that's location and hours of operation, things like that. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question in terms of how the board is going to uh, necessarily work with that and what can be on the website um, uh, uh, right now. Um, but I think you know they are allowed to have some things that uh, that at least information about the business products, things like that, um, and then it'll just have to fit, in, and it'll be the board as to whether or not you know what fits within the definition of advertisement. Okay, so the, it sounds like the board then has some flexibility within the the language here to make decisions like that. Yeah, I think especially when you're talking about um, websites, um, because that's a little, you know, complex um, there is I think the board is going to be focused a lot on that piece of the marketing and what's allowable under under the chapter. Okay, good. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I miss a, a sentence or two, and my fault, but can um, is there some, I'm actually, it's an interesting question. Is there something in the bill that references websites that will give the um, board some authority over them? Yep, um, it does say, if you look at the definition of advertisement um, and it talks about uh, verbal statements calculated to induce sales of cannabis or cannabis products, including, and then it, and it references the internet. And so, how they're gonna interpret whether or not it's an advertisement uh, designated, you know, kind of intended to induce sales or whether or not they're gonna say, um, uh, and so they would want to review the whole website or what's on there um, or whether or not they're just gonna have information about this is our business, this is where it is, this is our phone number, our 
email address. Uh, these are our hours of operation. Um, you know, that is uh, different because there is specifically language in here that talks about that the term doesn't include um, uh, any uh, non-commercial material that's not intended to induce sales. So I'm not sure how that they would look at that and whether or not they would say that the, the whole entire website, you know, just the existence of the website is, it fits in that category or not. And uh, Representative Gannon, this is something that your committee talked about. Uh, yes, um, not this year so much, but um, last year when we were handling F-164, um, I, I do think a website would fall under the definition of advertisement, especially if you look at what other states have done, or I should say other cannabis establishments in other states. Typically, it's not just information about how to get to the, the location, but it advertises product, um, uh, you know, flour, edibles, concentrates. There's usually a list and price information. I would think that would fall under our advertising definition. So it, it, it's not permitted. It has to be reviewed and it's not permitted if more than 15% can be seen by. Um, Correct. And what most other um, cannabis, cannabis establishments in other states do is that they do have um, a, a thing at the beginning that asks if you're 21 years or, or, or not. Um, so that... I think that will have to be determined by the Cannabis Control Board, whether no. that's sufficient um, to block people from that are younger than 21 years of old or age or old, younger from viewing the website. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine a website that's not um, intended to solicit sales, so. Uh, I can't either. Yeah. Um, okay, interesting question. Sorry, I got distracted by it too. Um, Let's see, Representative Maslin. And yeah, um, a question I had as this discussion began, which has mostly been answered. I think what would happen if some helpful person decided to do such a website on his or her own? And I think mostly we've we've answered that question. Um, and I guess we'll just have to see something. I mean, I can't imagine someone wouldn't try. We'll just have to see how it plays out. Thanks. Um, okay, I think we're back to you, Representative Kornheiser. I'm done, sorry. Um, I would love if Michelle could talk through the changes and I'll explain my thinking with the changes afterwards, yeah. if that works. Great, okay. And this so, is, uh, some, I don't so know if it's on the website yet, but it's, on, it's in your email. And it's um, been posted. So this is Representative Kornheiser's proposal um, dated the 12th at 7.42 last mm -hmm. night. Um, and I just want to make sure, I just want to ask the question about whether it's been posted in case somebody's watching. Um, uh, Sorsha, has it been posted? They are both posted on the website, net, website Thank now. You. Thanks. Yeah, go, go ahead. So there's two issues in this amendment. Um, the first one having to do with the fees that are paid by integrated licensees into the Cannabis Business Development Fund. And then the other issue is eliminating the advertisement review fee. And so the first instance of amendment is, um, is striking language that currently has it. There's a, a, remember during that time period where the integrated may be selling to the public prior to the retailers coming online in the fall. Um, and in S25 is out of GovOps, it has, um, it's 3% of gross sales uh, prior to that date when the, when the retailers come online um, with, a, with a cap of $50,000 and, um, and that would be eliminated and, and the substitute language would be a one-time contribution of $50,000 per integrated license to be made on or before October 15th. So rather than doing the calculation and having perhaps a variable number, it would just be a flat $50,000 per integrated licensee. Um, so there would be a potential of two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, and then the second, third, and fourth instance of amendments have to do with eliminating the advertising review fee. Okay. Um, so these are all. Um, I'm not deeply attached to any of these. They were all designed to sort of simplify and streamline. Um, so the my understanding is that. Um, Previous, in some previous conversations about this, the um, 
dispensaries were sort of comfortable paying a flat fee and it moved into a percentage. Um, and I think it's nice for the fund to be able to sort of count on an income and for um, to make that a flat fee. I think we also, Michelle talked about having the money go directly into the fund um, rather than looping through ACCD. Um, but I'm realizing I missed that when we were um, going through this. I, I remember that came up as an issue yesterday in committee, but I didn't know, sorry, I didn't realize you wanted that as part of your amendment. Um, so. And then um, on the advertising, I think um, we've already shown some of sort of the confusion about what advertising is and what it isn't. And that's absolutely reasonable for the board to be going back and forth with folks who are um, trying to set up advertising. But the example that sort of made this clearest to me is if we are thinking about a web ad, like say a very targeted web ad, that can cost the actual price of the ad could cost pennies on the dollar for someone. Um, and But the back and forth about how, how often you change an ad and what is a change in an ad um, requires just like a really solid positive regulatory environment and the kind of conversation I think we're all imagining the board will be having with establishments. Um, but in but requiring to attach a fee to every single one of those applications rather than have that be part of the, sort of the services that the board is offering um, as part of engaging in a regulatory environment um, seems a lot clearer. So, you know, good web advertising changes every week slightly. Um, and so is that a single ad? Is that multiple ads? Um, are tweaks to a website considered new ads? Are they existing ads? So just would, um, to have the board set the fee for an establishment to include the cost to the board of negotiating around approved and unapproved advertising. Uh, committee, questions? Uh, Representative Till. Yeah, I, I don't really know the lay of the land in terms of the, the five um, groups that we would anticipate going for integrated licenses to dispensaries now. But, you know, part of what we was the plan with, with this all along was to try to encourage small Vermont businesses as opposed to big, you know, big tobacco, big pot um, coming in and, and, and taking these things over. And I, I just wonder if the straight $50,000 could be an impediment to, you know, a, a relatively small Vermont business trying to do uh, the integrated license. And I don't know if any of the dispensaries fit that kind of description, um, but you know, that, that, that would be my first concern. I, I had thought that only the dispensaries could get the integrated license. Am I right. right, but I don't know if any of them are, you know, oh, relatively I narrow Vermont it. businesses now. I see. Um, what yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, anybody want to jump in on that? Uh, Representative Gannon. Um. I can't speak to all of the dispensaries, but I, I mean, um, there is one very large player in the market that actually controls both a dispensary in the Burlington, Chinon County area and one down in Wyndham County um, where I live. Um, so that's the largest player. And then I think there, there are smaller dispensary players like in Montpelier, um, that a, very sm a fairly small operation. So um, th they're sort of all over the map. Um, to some extent, um, but you know, the the one in Chittenden County and in Wyndham County is large and has attracted outside capital. Yeah, so I, you know, that would make me um, really hesitant about raising the fee to a straight fifty thousand dollars, if since there is a variety of sizes of these uh, dispensaries currently, it might inhibit um, them going towards the integrated license. So, so my understanding is that this isn't actually a fee. This is a, uh, a, a it's called a contribution, but it seems to be a, a mandatory contribution. Um, and that it's 
basically capitalizing this fund um, that is going to be used to um, encourage smaller uh, uh, businesses in, in um, am I, I didn't go back and look at the language, but this, this is not the license fee, the integrated, uh, uh, there, there will be a, a, a separate license fee for uh, the integrated license in addition to this. Yes, I, I understand that. What I'm saying is this can be a detriment to those smaller players. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to encourage smaller players in this in this marketplace, and this in and of itself could be an additional detriment um, to to that, for, at least at the level of the integrated licenses. Uh, Representative Durfee. I'm wondering, uh, so integrated license holders who who are late in getting their license or aren't ramping up sales very quickly, everyone would now, any license holder that would be contributing $50,000, even if they had no sales, I mean, is there, uh, I mean, we want to somehow make exceptions for businesses that get their license on September 1st, for example, or uh, I'm just wondering how it how, how it's worded right now. I'm not quite sure about the, the original language either. Uh, is, that, is that a question for somebody? <laughs> uh, it's amusing. Okay, well then I'll go to uh, Representative Kornheiser. <laughs> um, I think Michelle can probably add some clarification, but my sort of um, one, this is to capitalize a fund that helps marginalized folks enter the market. So the more money that's in there, the more the small marginalized players can get into the market. The second thing here is that um, when I personally think of us making sure that, you know, small growers and small um businesses can enter the market, I do not think of the dispensaries. Um, I think that we are, the dispensaries can enter the market earlier in my understanding of the bill um, in order to make sure that we have a place for small growers to sell soon enough. Um, but they are, when I think of sort of larger players in the market, I think of the dispensaries. And so I wanna make sure that they are really paying very much their fair share into encouraging all of the other growth in the market. Dispensaries don't have to enter as, um, is it called commercial? The word just fell out of my head. The regular- the Integrated. Into no, the, the regular cannabis market, the non-medical market, they don't have to enter that side of the market if they don't want to. Um, but this is a, so for me, I see this as a way of really making sure that more small players will get in and we are encouraging the growth of small players um, into it. But Michelle, can you, I, will you answer David's question, even though David didn't ask you to answer his question? Sure. So, um, so there's so there are there's five licenses and uh, Robert, Representative Gannon is correct in that two of them are owned by the same folks, um, but those two and and the um, they are the ones that are actually locally owned, um, and the other three are larger corporations. So they may have a smaller. Um, share of the market, but they are outside. Um, they're owned by larger uh, cannabis organizations. And so the so the two licenses that shared for, for Brattleboro and for Chittenden County are, um, are local, I think, because somebody had asked that. And the cannabis trade, the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association, of which all four dispensaries belong, has testified in support of I don't know about just a flat $50,000. My general sense, I think as Representative Kornheiser had mentioned, I think there was an original kind of agreement maybe or discussion with them that they would agree to the, to the flat. And I can't remember the whole evolution of the 3% and 50, um, but that it had their support was my recollection. Um, so if, if that helps. And so it, it, I don't think they were 
concerned about it being a barrier to them participating in the adult use market. Um, it is a, a contribution. It's kind of a um, because they would have a potential, uh, potentially a, a maximum of a six month window in which to sell in the adult use market prior to the retailers coming on in the fall, um, that they would that they would be contributing to this business development fund to help um, smaller social equity applicants be able to enter the market. I mean, it's, it's a worthy fund uh, for sure. I, I do wonder whether uh, a business that said, sure, we'll, we'll be happy to, to go along with 3%, cap it at 50,000, wasn't thinking that they would get anywhere near 50,000 based on what their plans for opening were. That's the last of my musings on that. One of my concerns about the 3% is it just seems uh, to be taking this kind of artificial period of time and applying a percentage to it. That, um, and if you uh, wanted to pay less, you would just get your integrated license later um, and sell later, um, which doesn't help this fund at all. Um, if what we want is we want the integrated licensees to create the market, which is, uh, I think, what we're expecting them to do. Um, I don't think we should give, I don't, I don't think it makes sense to build in a benefit for starting later. Um, and that's, I think, what the 3% uh, does. So um, I'm, I think it's very important that we figure out a way to capitalize that fund. Um, I think that's a big piece of what we're trying to do in terms of the social equity issues here. Uh, Representative Massland and Representative Till. Yep. Um, sorry about the phone ring, ringing in the background. Um, I support the amendment for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is I remember the discussion last year when we were setting up these different levels of, of licenses um, and participated in um, but I was never all that enthusiastic about these different classes of licenses at different fees. It, um, you know, I accept that last year it was what it was, but I think simplicity in following the discussion from, from Janet and Emily and Michelle, formal name, formal name, formal name, um, I, I support the amendment. And I also think that an integrated license is a pretty big deal. And I don't think a $50 contribution to the fund is, is, is beyond the means of what um, these outfits are, um, where they're headed. I, I support $50, it's pretty, excuse me, 50,000. Straightforward, everybody. <laughs> <Just heroes. laughs> we Graham turned his camera on when he said $50 over and over again. <laughs> anyway, we're all playing by the same rules. We all know where we're headed. Um, this is a short version. I, I support the amendment. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, um, I, if, if we do this amendment, I do want to address the, the uh, flow of the money. Um, it doesn't make sense to me to have it go to ACCD and then to a fund. We, we fund funds directly all the time. And I'm, I'm looking for confirmation from Becky, uh, who may not give it to me, but um, I, I think I don't think there's any reason not to uh, put the money directly into the fund. Um, so before we actually vote on the bill, I, I'd like to see language with that change. Becky, did you hear my musings on that? Uh, so I think your question was whether you can put fees directly into a fund and, and that is, is done um, in other situations. Okay, uh, Representative Tell. Um, I, I wonder if Representative Gannon could tell us the, the thought process about the 3% in their committee. Yeah. Um, as I testified yesterday, um, we, we really didn't touch that. Um, that came from the Senate. Um, so uh, we did not discuss that in a lot of detail. Um, I, you know, just my, my two cents, I, I mean, I, I am happy with that part of the amendment. Um, I, I think that the integrated licensees can probably afford um, $50,000. And I think the social equity program um, is a very important component of the bill. Um, and so this would mean that instead of um, having a, a floating amount of money available for social equity, we would know if all the 
the dispensary signed on to become integrated licensees, we would have um, $750,000 um, in the fund. There's $500,000 appropriation plus if you add up all the dispensaries, you, you get to another $250,000. Uh, Representative Kornheiser. Um, on the advertising fees, I just sort of want to be clear again. I think it's really that I don't, um, I think it's really important that the advertising is approved and is a really meaningful conversation between the regulatory body and the applicant. I just um, hope that the fees set by, the fees recommended by the board and set by our body um, include the cost of negotiating those conversations. I think a per advertisement fee could get really um, wild really fast and would need to either, would need to be scaled to the exact type of advertisement. And it's one of those situations where like the examples never stop coming in. Um, and so that's sort of my two cents on it. I wanna be clear that I don't, I'm not imagining dropping the fees as a way of increasing advertising or encouraging advertising or anything like that, but just to create a more um, collaborative regulatory environment for negotiating those conversations. Uh, Representative Canfield. Yeah, so if we remove the advertising fees, is that gonna change the oversight that the board will have in these negotiations? I don't know. Does somebody want to no. take a shot at answering that? It it doesn't seem to me that no, it does. there's still a there's there's still a, a language in there that requires uh, the licensees to present all advertisements to the board for review. So the fee you could eliminate the fee and still require them to to do that. Okay, I have another question, Janet. Mm -hmm. And the three percent gross sales and integrated license. If we were to eliminate the cap, would those larger players maybe pay more? I don't know if anybody wants to jump in. Uh, Graham. Um, yeah, I'm Graham Campbell from the Joint Fiscal Office for the record. Um, so I would emphasize that the startup of cannabis markets in every other state is extremely uncertain about how it happens, how the rollout happens, whether you're going to, you know, it's going to be a slow rollout or whether it's going to be sort of a big pop at the beginning. It's quite uncertain. So I emphasize that for this, this discussion about this, this um, social equity fund. Um, our estimates based upon what we had for the cannabis market that were used in the fiscal estimates for S54 that passed last year are that under a 3% regime that was, as it came to this committee that the fund would raise likely $50,000 or less because the amount of sales are supposed to happen between. So we're estimating that sales are likely to begin sometime in the summer of 2022. So you really only have a couple months of sales, even if you're getting up and running basically from the get-go. Um, and so based upon the experiences in states like Colorado and Oregon, which had really pretty successful cannabis markets, the average establishment sales there are just about one and a half million dollars per year in the first year. So it's not as if every, every outlet is going sort of gangbusters. Um, in those states. And so that is based upon our estimate is that under a 3% regime, you'd get less than $50,000 in money for this fund. Um, and that's sort of on the flip side with related to this amendment, a flat $50,000, you know, as it was sort of touched upon um, by some other committee members here, um, there are sort of big differences in the size of the players here in the integrated market. And it really, um, the decision about whether to even enter the market will depend upon whether they are ready. And I think the 50,000, the flat 50,000 might play a role in that because if you're a larger dispensary and you're able to sort of get selling right from the get go, it makes sense. You can make the sales to sort of make it worthwhile to pay the 50,000. But if you're a sort of smaller dispensary, even if you're one of the larger ones and you're not up, able to get sort of up and running until August, September, 
then you might make the financial decision that it doesn't make any sense to, to enter the market until after October or whatever the date is for the, for the social equity contribution, um, because you'll have to pay $50,000 the moment you make your first retail sale. And so that's, I think that's another sort of um, layer here that I add. I would add again, just emphasize that there's a ton of uncertainty here. They might do way better than we are thinking than we're there we're estimating. And so this 50,000 might not be that difficult of a contribution uh, for them. But um, just to lay out sort of the fiscal impacts for this fund, I think under a 3% regime, I don't think anyone will get close to the cap under the estimates that we have right now. And I think under the 50,000, you know, I was thinking about it last night. I'd have to think about which dispensaries would enter the market because um, I have, just based upon the data that I've seen and doing this estimate, I have doubts that every single integrated um, license holder would enter the market under a $50,000 regime. So I don't okay. think it will just be the straight five times 50,000. But those that will operate from day one are gonna get six months before October 15th. If everything on the timeline goes according to plan. Um, yeah. And so it, you know, it, it's, it, it remains to be seen whether that's actually going to be held in place. I mean, we when we originally wrote the fiscal note on this, we estimated sales would begin in the spring of 2022. We've since pushed that back, you know, because there has been delays because of the pandemic and also the formation of the Cannabis Control Board. And so, you know, to be conservative, we're estimating that sales will start probably sometime in the summer, but we don't know exactly if that's going to be followed. So, um yeah, I, I agree. It, it, it really depends on when when the market gets up and running and who is able to enter the market from sort of the get go. Um, um, that will determine how much gets put into this fund under a 3% regime or under a 50,000 flat regime. Uh, comments, questions. So if we if we go with three percent, we know that we're under two fifty um, just based on projected sales. And if we go with fifty thousand, we may be under two fifty because we'll only have two participants rather than five. Is that basically the math? I, I can't say for sure whether it, it would be a hundred thousand or the fifty thousand, but that's probably the way I'm leaning is that those two the the large dispensary that owns the two outlets. Are the most likely to be more up and ready and ready to go to pay that. Um, and and if we went with the three percent, we just because of the way sales are going to ramp up, we might be at that same level as well. Uh, you, yeah, right now in the fiscal night, I have fifty thousand dollars or less, so you might get more under the fifty thousand flat. Um, but yeah. again, I, I think the calculation for a business, whether the end to the market is completely different under a flat 50,000 as it, than it is under the 3%. Um, so, you know, I think it, there's another layer of uncertainty there. So committee, where do you wanna go with this? Emily. Also. Um. Jim's welcome to speak first if he. Well, I'll support it um, with Janet's comments a few minutes ago about tracking where the money goes. Least like having it go into the fund rather than yeah, right the agency. Tracking um, means putting in the in the in the language where yeah. it goes. Yep, yeah. uh, Representative Kornheiser. Um, happy to move the whole thing. Wondering if people would prefer to do that. Um, two pieces separate there or not. So um, we have, uh, to, uh, let me just interject in terms of scheduling. We have a 10 o'clock uh, joint meeting with Commerce, so we can't be late. Um, I have to drop off in a minute or two just to do a couple of phone calls in preparation for that. Um, and um, what I'd like to do, we have one amendment done. Uh, what I'd like to do is to at least get a sense of the committee with a straw vote on, on this proposal, either as a single unit or divided into two, however you all want to do that, um, and then get a final um, amendment to 
to vote the bill later. We'll do it later today. We will do it today. Um, we're going to finish up with this, but um, but I just that seems like the right best way to proceed. And let me ask the committee: Are there any other amendments that anybody is going to put on the table? That's good. Okay. Uh, so uh, Emily, how do you, your amendments? You should. I think you should decide how you want to proceed with them. I would like to proceed as a package. Okay. Thanks. So do you want to do a strong vote right now on that? Um, are people ready? This is, this is a, um, well, uh, we need to see language uh, on the agency movement. So let, let's just get a show of hands of people who support the package. Um, and uh, use your yellow hand just because I can't count that well on here. I'm trying to raise my hands. I don't know if it's working. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, Great. Okay. Got, one, two, got enough here. Okay. Okay. So um, so good. So we'll we'll come back with an amendment. Um, Especially if you can lower everybody's hand, I suppose I could do that. Um, we'll come back. We'll come back with a full package. Um, we'll vote on that, and then we'll vote on the bill. Um, so, uh, Emily, this is all yours. I'm dropping off at, for the moment. Okay. Thanks. And can I just ask for a yeah. clarification uh, on the mm -hmm. the money going into the fund? Mm -hmm. Um, so the 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 money does go into the fund. I think the in. I understand. I want it to go directly to the fund. It goes to ACCD, and there's this funny transfer in there. No, the if you look at the the language of the fund, it's comp the money is um, is in goes into the fund, and then in section fourteen, I think we we're looking at the appropriation, the five hundred thousand dollars. Is goes into the fund as well, but then there's a subsection B that has the five hundred thousand being appropriated from the fund to ACCD. It doesn't mention the, the 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 integrated license money that's in the fund. So I think what you were it sounds to me like what you're saying is that you just leave it in the fund and you want to strike subsection B in section fourteen. I and think that was yes. Fund. Because it, it, they, if you look at the funding language, it does the the fund comprised of those things, and then Section fourteen moves part of those monies to ACCD. So I think that's what you're concerned about. Is, in order for them to subgrant it, yes. Oh, I but, think we both understood it to be the reverse. So maybe that is okay. Um. If you if you look at if you look at in section 12 on page 23. Give me, give me one second to do that because I have a few too many tabs with a few too many amendments and sure. uh, happening. Sorry. And I don't know if we all need to if everyone wants to take a break and I can just talk to Michelle or we can do this all together. What do? I'm okay staying here. Are you okay. on page 23, okay. Michelle? Is that right? Uh, yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. In section 12. And so you look at section 987, which is establishing the fund. See subsection B, what's comprised of the fund, what's in the fund. So it has all of the money is goes into the fund. And if you look down and you move on to uh, page, the bottom of page 25 in section 14, this is where, and, I, and I'm sorry, I can't, uh, this is language that came from a joint fiscal office in, a, in Senate approach. So I, I don't know the reasoning why they felt as though it had to be done this way, but there's the appropriation from the general fund into the cannabis business development fund and then they're moving that $500,000 from the Canvas Business to Fund to ACCD. And so I think the concern was that you just want it to be in the fund rather than the $500,000 moving, just moving through the fund to ACCD. 
I think we both remembered it as the reverse of that. And so I don't know. I yeah, think it needs to be I... an ACCD in order for ACCD to grant it. Um, Yeah, I thought it was the other way too that okay. we were talking about going to ACCD and then the Cannabis Control Fund. And the conversation was, well, why not just send it right to the fund? Mm -hmm. So it seems like if it's like that, it probably doesn't need any changes. Um, is Becky still there? I am still here, yes. Okay. It's not possible for ACCD to grant out of the fund, right? Or do they need it in their own? To, sorry, who, who is administering the fund? If ACCD is sub-granting to administer the fund to someone else, can the money stay in the fund or does it need to go to ACCD for them to do that? I think that they would have to be administering a fund to be able to um, grant money out of a fund. Okay. Um, sometimes special fund language also includes that money in the deposit in the fund can be used for specific uh, grant purposes. So if it references that, that might do the trick. And then not have it go to ACCD, but just have the fund reference the specific grant purposes. Yeah, so you can say, you know, money, any, any funds deposited into this special fund may be used for the following purposes. And then you can spell out what the purpose is that you want it to be used for. Representative Gannon, do you have some? Yeah, so if, if you go back to section 12, it does spell out the purposes the fund can be used for. Okay. So then we could leave the money still in the fund and not move it to ACCD, Becky? Um, I'm not as familiar with the language, so I have to look at section 12 to see if it allows for that. Um, just one moment. Becky, okay, I just emailed the excerpt so you don't have to okay, thanks. the document. Yep. It looks like it does allow for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it says it's allowed to provide those loans and grants. So I think it's an, it's an allowable use of that money. Okay. So so then for section 14, we don't necessarily need B, I guess. Is that correct? You, you wouldn't need B if the authorized uses are in section 12? That was my original understanding and that now yeah. my new understanding, yes. Yeah, you just stri strike B and I think it works. Yeah. We're gonna let Becky catch up because she probably also had 12 tabs open when this conversation started. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, because the funds are being directly deposited into the special fund, uh, you don't need an appropriation um, into the fund, I think. That's the question, right? No, do we need to m appropriate out of the fund to ACCD is the question. Uh, no, I, I don't okay. think you do because the okay. fund is is allowing for that money to come out of it, so. And Representative Gannon, are we confusing something terribly that was deeply intentional? Okay. Not to my knowledge. Great. <laughs> Michelle, do you? No, I think I think it's probably fine. I'll probably okay. circle back just with Stephanie Barrett to double check her as to why her recommendation was in Senate appropriations was that it had to be that, but it might have been that 
she didn't have the whole picture of everything. And so I'll double check that. And then as long as everything's okay, I, I understand your intent and I can include striking subsection B in your committee amendment. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, and, and that was actually gonna be my recommendation too, is just to double check with JFO if there is some reason why it sort of administratively needs to be done that way um, to, to transfer to ACCD, but they would probably be the best to answer that question. And so can I just get clarification? So for the committee amendment, it'll be uh, Representative Ansel's amendment plus Representative Kornheiser's amendment, both amendments, uh, and um, as well as the striking subsection B in section 14. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And then we'll vote on it this afternoon when we come back from the floor which we hope will be soon after we get to the floor. Thank you. Representative Kornheiser, it's time for the joint committee with House Commerce and the link is in the email. Thanks, Sarsha. See everyone there. You're welcome.